Good morning. Welcome to Bethel today. Glad to see everyone here. Happy Independence Day. The church received a card this week that I'd like to read to you. It says a note of special thanks. I will treasure your gift always. Dear Bethel people, I miss you all. Thank you all for the lovely flowers and all the birthday cards you sent. God bless you all. My love and prayers, Twyla Wagner. To begin our worship service this morning, uh, being how it is Independence Day, we'll sing number 578, if you choose to use the hymnals, number 578, America the Beautiful. Let's sing all four verses. Let's be standing together as we sing. Leading us into our prayer time this morning, we'll sing number 361, Spirit of the Living God, and we'll sing it twice through.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning thankful for this time to gather to worship you, thankful for the opportunity to hear your word, to fellowship together, to enjoy each other's company. This morning, we are especially thankful for this day that we remember the the beginning of our country and the freedoms that it has given us through the years. We come to you knowing that as we go through this life, we need times of renewal and we ask that your spirit falls upon us and renews us. We thank you for each blessing. We pray for those who have special concerns. We ask because you know each one and you are able to handle each one, to act upon each one. We thank you for your son who came to this earth and lived the perfect life that he might be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We ask your blessing as we continue in this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Leading us into communion this morning, we'll sing number 156, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and we'll sing all four verses.
On this anniversary of the creation of our nation, we're reminded of the extraordinary actions taken by a small group of men who envisioned a future that transcended their current circumstances. They eloquently captured the essence and authority of their vision in a document known as the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration states the principles on which our government and our identity as Americans are based. Unlike the other founding documents, the Declaration of Independence is not legally binding, but it is powerful. Abraham Lincoln called it a rebuke and a stumbling block to tyranny and, and oppression. It continues to inspire people around the world to fight for freedom and equality. The most recognized portion of the Declaration is the beginning of the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our celebration of this event may include picnics, patriotic songs, and fireworks. On this first day of the week, we gather to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We envision a future that transcends our current circumstances. The essence of our vision and authority is embodied in a series of documents collectively known as the Holy Bible. In its pages, we find God's truth. From its verses, we can stitch together a paragraph of timeless authority. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Our celebration of these events is called communion, a reenactment of the Last Supper that Christ shared with his disciples. As we commemorate our independence as a nation, let us also recognize our dependence on Jesus Christ for our salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special time that in the service we pause to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you that so many years ago with his disciples, he instituted this, this memorial that as we eat the bread, as we drink from the cup, we are reminded that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed, that he died to take the punishment for our sin. We ask your blessing as we commemorate this together. In your son's name, amen.
morning. The kids can be dismissed for junior worship. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, this week, I discovered, I think, the, uh, the first really positive thing about the masks. I managed to get my first cold in the last year and a half. <laughs> you know, I, 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 went, I went a year and a half without getting a cold, but I've had the, the scratchy throat and the, and the stuffed up nose this week, and uh, so it's, uh, it, it, that was interesting to me. Uh, hey, I hope you are having a good weekend. Uh, hopefully you have, have uh, managed to get some sleep amidst the friends and family and neighbors that are, are uh, shooting off the poppers over these last few days. We've got a neurotic dog that, uh, that, that is scared of everything anyway. And so for the last like three nights, he's either been glued to one side of my leg or hiding somewhere. And uh, a couple nights ago, he decided he was going to sleep on the bed. And then every time something went off, he'd start shaking. And so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting, interesting few days in our house, uh, but exciting nonetheless. So, hey, I've got a lot to preach, and I want to show you a video this morning also. Not yet, Demi, don't worry. <laughs> Demi, Demi just looked nervous, because Demi's been a little nervous about the video anyway. She was like, wait, that's not my notes yet. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we'll get started in Scripture. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for this nation that we live in that, that gives us the freedom to worship, the freedom to express ourselves. God, that, that today we can gather without fear of someone rushing in through these doors. We can leave this place today without fear. But God, we also want to thank you ultimately for the freedom that we have in Christ that that is true freedom, that our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in nations that are locked down, they are still free. They are still just as free as we are. God, I thank you for that freedom. I thank you for the foresight of those men hundreds of years ago who set out to make this nation a place where, where we all could worship, free from the fear of persecution. But God, we also recognize that that day is coming where we will receive persecution, and even Peter warned us about that. Your word warns us. Your word says for us to prepare for that. So God, prepare our hearts even now. Take this time, God, and begin that process. If we've t as we've talked about the last few weeks, begin that process of refining God, removing all of those impurities from our life so that we can be free to worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, take our time together this morning. Use it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, you always hear that honesty is the best policy, right? But I, I actually started to wonder, is that really always true, you know? Sometimes people maybe don't need to hear the whole truth and nothing but the truth. There are questions that someone might ask you that maybe the full truth isn't the smartest thing to share. I often question those drug commercials that are out, you know, they come on the TV and they list the side effects of the, of the drug, potential side effects. Now I know they're legally bound to tell us what those side effects are, but some of those effects will definitely keep me from asking my doctor about them, no matter what they're going to cure. I heard one that was supposed to be for depression. The side effects were anger, depression, and increased thoughts of suicide. Well, how is that helpful if I am dealing with depression? Sounds a little bit counterproductive if you ask me. I, I, usually don't remember what the drug is, but I'll often remember the side effects. There was one that I, I looked up because the side effects, and I didn't look at what the drug actually was, but I looked at the side effects. The side effects were weakness, fever, chills, itching, back pain, headache, problems with your teeth and gums, and gas with an oily discharge. I frankly don't care what that is going to heal. I am not taking that medicine. There, there is no chance. I am not risking that one. Maybe I don't want to know all of those side effects. But on the other hand, 
if I know what those side effects are, I'm probably going to make a more educated decision. I might not take that medicine. It enables me to make a decision based on all of the facts. I want to know all of the possibilities. I don't want somebody hiding something from me. I want to know my options. Well, how does all this fit in with 1 Peter this morning? We've been looking at this letter that he wrote to the church. Specifically, if you, if you kind of rewind in your mind to the first week you looked at 1 Peter, specifically he's writing to a group that was called the dispersion. The dispersion were those, were those Christians that had been spread out. They were forced to leave their homes and head out into other parts of the world because of their faith. These were Christians who were facing constant persecution from their families, from the government, from their former religious connections. And so they are feeling completely alone at this point. And so Peter writes this letter to encourage them. Now, as we've already seen, it's not always that encouraging. Sometimes he says there are going to be horrible things that happen. So for Peter, honesty really is the best policy. And so this morning, he's going to continue his letter with some honest encouragement that might be hard to swallow. It might be hard to swallow for us, and it was certainly hard to swallow for those first century readers. He's already talked about some of it, especially in the first chapter, but he really hits home here in the end of chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles uh, and you want to follow along with me, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. If you don't have a Bible of your own, whether you're here or whether you're watching online, if you're here, you can just take one. You know, we've got, we've got lots, and they'll make more. And so, so, you know, take one out of the pew right in front of you or, or underneath you. Or if you're at home and don't have a Bible, please let us know. We will make sure that you get one. Contact us through email or the Facebook page or however you can contact us, and we will make sure that you have a Bible of your own. So either way, you can follow it physically in a Bible or on the screen uh, behind me or right below me online. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Peter says this, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of Christ and glory. Because, I'm sorry, that's what I get for switching my page too quick. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. I love how sometimes the authors in, the, in scripture, they'll list all these horrible things. And then there's one that's like, meddler, really? You're going to put that on equal level with murderer? Well, yeah. That sin separates us from God. It creates that, that barrier between us and one another. So, yeah, meddler is on the same level as murderer, or thief, and evildoer. Uh, verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us... What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You know, if honesty is the best policy and we're being completely honest about things, the church is not the darling of society that it used to be. It, the church used to be the center of the community. There was a reason that revivals were so popular and effective in the early 20th century because everyone went to the church for the events that they did. It was their entertainment. It was their opportunity to connect with their friends and family members. And so the church was the center of the community. It was their source for truth even those who didn't believe in God yet. Well, today, that's not the case anymore. Being a pastor and minister used to be an honorable job, and people would respect 
the position. Now, there are usually one of two responses when people learn that I am a pastor. One, they act with a bit of disdain, and they kind of turn their noses up. It's becoming more and more contact, or more and more common, that people don't have regular contact with someone that they would consider a Bible-believing Christian. And so often when people find out that that's what I am, that I believe that the Bible is true, they kind of look with some kind of disdain. The second response is they'll tell me all of the reasons that they don't go to church anymore. Like, they, I don't know if they feel like they've got to confess to me, but all of a sudden, every reason why they don't go to church anymore comes out. Now, obviously, those are both sweeping generalizations, but it just continues to point for me to the fact that the church is not the pillar of the community anymore for the community. Now, if the church went away, the community would begin to, to wonder what was going on. If, if all of the things that the church is doing in the name of Christ stopped, there would be a lot of people who are hungry. There would be a lot of orphans on the streets. There would be a lot of hospitals that would have to shut down. But as the, ch the community looks at the church, the church is having to swim upstream against the current more and more. Now, to be clear, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because even as we read here in 1 Peter, God knew this was what was going to happen. And as we look historically, the persecuted church grows. The persecuted church grows far faster than anywhere else in the world. God knew this would happen. It happened to Jesus, and Peter says, guess what? If you're following Jesus, it's going to happen to you as well. And so what is our response? Both as individuals and as the church, how are we going to respond? Well, one of the things that we're seeing often within the church, and some churches are doing, is they're beginning to, to downplay the gospel. They've taken Paul's words to become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. They've taken that text to an unhealthy extreme. You see, when Paul was stating those words in 1 Corinthians 9, he also ended it with, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. If we adjust our views, or if we try to adjust the truth simply to bring them in, it is no longer the gospel. Even the prosperity gospel that simply says that God wants you happy and rich is a watering down and would be considered church light. Now, I don't, I don't want to have a church light you know, tastes great and less filling. I, I want the full gospel. No holds barred, no holding back. Honesty is the best policy. We need all of scripture, not just picking and choosing what fits for us, not just picking and choosing what makes us comfortable. I, I love that Rick was reading kind of the, that second chapter, second paragraph of, of the preamble to the Constitution. But one of the things that has always struck me is our founding fathers said we are all endowed with the right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're not guaranteed happiness. When we look at scripture, we are not guaranteed happiness. Now, our founding fathers said we are, are guaranteed the right to pursue that, but we're not guaranteed happiness. When we look at scripture, there are a lot of things that happen that may not make us happy. We are guaranteed in scripture joy. That is one of the fruits of God's spirit is joy. Part of the fruit of God's spirit is joy. I want the full gospel. If honesty is the best policy, let's be clear about a few blessings that we see from God in this text this morning. First, we are blessed with suffering. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that sounds a bit counterproductive again. We're blessed with suffering. Sounds kind of like I'm, I'm presenting those side effects from those drugs that are supposed to help you. How can suffering be a blessing? Take a look again at verse 13. No, it's not verse 13. 
Oh, uh, because I didn't turn my page back. I was like, wait a minute. What? Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. You see, when we are sharing in Christ's sufferings, that is fellowship with Christ. Even Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we are truly in Christ, Peter and Paul tell us that we will go through persecution. Perhaps this is one of the ways that we will know that we are in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Nick Ripkin said in his book, The Insanity of God, that in China, they don't consider someone ready to lead the church until they have spent time in prison for their faith. They consider prison like their Bible college because even though the Chinese government thinks that they are stopping the spread of the gospel by, by, by imprisoning these pastors and these church leaders, what they don't understand is you get all of these people of faith into one place and they're in prison. They begin to learn and they begin to study and they begin to talk about what's next for the church and so they go out from prison and they go back into their communities and they are leading the church because of the time they spent in prison. Not in spite of that time, but because of the time that they spent in prison. I don't think that's what the Chinese government had in mind. You see, those folks understand that when a person suffers for their faith, they are in fellowship with Jesus. They are blessed with suffering. However, look a few verses into our text this morning, and we see kind of a, a caveat, if you will, caveat. Verse 15, he says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Sometimes our own suffering has nothing to do with the fellowship that we have with Jesus. Sometimes our suffering is a result of our own wrong actions. Not every bad thing that happens to us is because of our faith. Honestly, if we make stupid choices, we are going to have to live with the consequences of those choices. Our suffering is often brought on by our own failures, moral decisions, addiction, our own tongue, managing our life deficiently. All of those can bring about a suffering that is not a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. When we suffer because of those, it's not because we're in fellowship with Christ, it's because we are allowing those old sins to come back in, to allowing, allowing us to live by that old nature instead of in the new life that Jesus Christ brings. So suffering can be a result of our own actions. Honestly, suffering can also come simply because we live in a fallen world. Not all suffering is the result of my fellowship with Christ. Not all suffering is the result of my sin either. Recently, that condo in Florida has been all over the news, and as I wrote my sermon this week, they were still hoping to find a few, few people alive. Uh, fascinating. I was reading one article uh, about there is a family that keeps receiving phone calls from a landline of a couple that, was, that has not been found yet. And, and the phone company can't figure out how, I mean, everything has been, has been crushed. One, fa it's a family member, they keep receiving phone calls from this one landline. They said that's normal sometimes for a cell phone. And so they're really hoping that they can still find some of the people in, buried in the rubble, but every day that it goes on, those chances get smaller and smaller. Turns out there was structural damage to that building long before the collapse that people had been warned about. When we look at the results of that degradation, when we look at the fact that that, the, that building wasn't taken care of appropriately, what we have to realize is those people who suffered in that destruction were not more evil or more holy than anyone else. This collapse was a result of a fallen world. And no matter what religious talking heads might have said at the time, 
Things like Hurricane Katrina were not God's punishment on the city of New Orleans. It was not God punishing that city because of their sin. Sometimes we suffer because we live in a fallen world. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22 is very clear. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Sometimes our suffering is a result of a fallen world. People will often try to blame God for their suffering. Whether their suffering is a result of personal choices, or whether their result is the, or the suffering is a result of a fallen world, none of that changes the reality of who God is. None of that changes His character. When we suffer, God is still God. There's a quote that has been attributed to George Orwell. He was a known atheist, wrote books like 1984. And this quote said, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Listen to that again. The further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Honesty is the best policy. And to be honest, no matter what suffering we are facing, that doesn't change who God is. He is still holy. He is still sovereign. He is still God. And the more society drifts from that truth, the more they will hate those who speak that truth. Our fellowship with God will begin with a blessing of suffering. Now, I thought about sharing a story this morning of a man that I met on a mission trip several, year, several years ago. I'm actually not going to share exactly where he was from since this is going out on the internet, and I will probably cut this from the uh, live stream after the fact. If you're watching live, you'll see it. Uh, if you're watching this later, now there's going to be a little gap. But um, I, I wanted you to hear this. Instead of just hearing this from me, uh, it's through a translator. It's about five minutes long, uh, and, and so... I really felt like it was worth it to hear from, in my opinion, this giant of the faith himself that looks like an ordinary man who has understood that suffering through a fellowship in Christ. So let's go ahead and, and start that video between the two places. My wife became ill and it was after second year and it was the Sunday right after Easter. So we had our worship service and Bible study and everything, and I had to take my wife to the hospital, and, and it was about a kilometer, 65 kilometers. From this man was unwilling to simply sit by and let persecution stop him from spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. After he healed, he knew he had no choice but to go back to that same village where he had lost his wife. And the church grew to over 900 people. That's incredible. And, and when I met this man, I, I thought, this guy hardly looks any older than me. But one thing I heard over and over from him, and I, I sat in that room with about five different individuals that day, and I heard similar stories. But one of the things I heard over and over and over again, as they would ask us to pray for them, they would ask us, and they said, please don't pray that the persecution would end, but pray that we would have the strength to stand in the midst of that persecution. In our text, verse 17, says, it is time for the judgment to begin at the household of God. We have to get the word out. Even if that means persecution. 
even if that means loss, when we are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, he says we will be persecuted. Honesty is the best policy. If we're being honest, that's part of the gospel. Now, I don't want to just leave it there this morning because there was another blessing that we receive. We are blessed with suffering, but we are blessed with joy. In verse 13, Peter makes sure joy is already covered. He said, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. When we are, fellowship, when we are in fellowship with Christ, we will be blessed with joy at times that are not usually met with joy. We can have joy in the face of persecution. We can have joy in the face of loss. We can have joy in the face of living in a fallen world that is not our home. God has something greater, something bigger in store for us. It probably isn't the best sales pitch to tell people, hey, come follow Jesus and guess what you get? You get to suffer. <laughs> not the best sales pitch, but it's part of the gospel. And I believe honesty really is the best policy. We are doing people a great disservice when we tell them, hey, come and follow Jesus and all your problems will be fixed. We still are going to face consequences. We're still going to face consequences for our own choices, our own actions, we're still going to face the difficulties of a fallen world. We are going to face persecution as we fellowship with Jesus Christ. It isn't an easy or a convenient truth, but it is the truth. And as we've seen throughout 1 Peter, as people see us living the life, as people see us living out the faith that we are called to, that's different from the rest of the world, they're going to want to know about our hope. They're going to want to know about the hope that we have. That man, as he returned back to that village, people knew that he was beaten. They knew that he had lost his wife. No one would have blamed him for staying away. But as he came back, he was able to preach a new gospel. No, not a new gospel, the old gospel, that Jesus brings life. And he was able to preach. In his words, he said, I was able to, pre to live what I had been preaching. Christian, it's time that we live what we've been preaching. People are going to want to know about the hope that we have. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. Everything else can fail us. Our hope is in Christ alone. And as Peter finishes this chapter, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. No matter what we face, our souls are entrusted to a faithful creator, and he will always do what is right. Would you stand with me together this morning as we sing and as we commit to living the lives that God has called us to live, as we commit to living different lives in this fallen world so that people see our hope? Will you sing with me this morning?
by way of announcements this week, uh, we are fast coming upon Vacation Bible School, and we have a quick video to show regarding that. for the most epic adventure ever? Next summer, Group VBS is taking kids on a ride they'll never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. Your church will be on track at Sing and Play Express. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right Get ready for high energy fun at Locomotion Games. Experience impactful Bible lessons and Bible adventures. You'll have amazing discoveries at Imagination Station. Take a glimpse into the world of five awesome kids who learned that Jesus' power pulls us through. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway. So that is coming up July 20th through 23rd, and then also on Sunday the 25th. And by the way, on July 25th, that Sunday, we will have a single service uh, as the Vacation Bible School closing. And as I recall, it'll be at 1045, the normal second service time. So you have a Sunday to look forward to sleeping in a bit. And uh, we will have Sunday school at 9.45 as usual, then the, the church worship service, which will be the closing VBS program at 10.45. Uh, if you are a VBS volunteer, please make sure to attend one of the meetings during the Sunday school hour, one of the next three Sundays, today the 11th or the 18th. Also, there are still needs for supplies and donations and decorations and things like that. Uh, there are slips of paper out in a couple of places in the foyer. If you uh, have some things that you could either donate or uh, uh, let the church borrow as decorations or that kind of thing, please check those papers out and see how you can help out with the Vacation Bible School. Uh, let's see, are there any other announcements to be made this morning? Hearing none, Mike Meeker has our benediction. Grace, Heavenly Father, we thank you ever so much for a good, good day of life. Father, we thank you for the message this morning. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that we, uh, as Christians, we can always come before you and trust you and know that you are God. Father, we know that uh, there's going to be days in our lives that's going to be a little different from uh, what we want it to be. But, Father, we know that uh, through all things we can lean upon you to help others come to know you as well and draw closer because I believe and we believe that uh, suffering will come but uh, should draw us closer to you. And uh, we just thank you that uh, we can trust you, Lord. Father, we are blessed uh, for all that uh, you give us. And may we share those blessings when we can. And as we go to our Sunday school hour and our second service here in a little bit, we pray that you uh, guide and bless us throughout that time and this coming week dear God may we represent you with our lives and our lips and our actions all these things dear God we ask and pray in Jesus name amen